Hello, I'm Dr. Elena Roberts, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm excited to be speaking to you virtually on Thursday, March 3rd, but until then, I wanted to give you a preview of what I'll be discussing. So I'm a professor now, but a little over 12 years ago, I was an undergraduate working and wondering what I wanted to do with my life. Hoping to learn more about my background in the hopes that it would illuminate something about myself, I started researching my family and talking to older relatives. Not only did I discover a part of the African diaspora I didn't know existed, I also discovered what I wanted to do for my career. My father's family is from Oklahoma, not where you are, but in the south central part of the state, Ardmore. When I was younger, I would visit Ardmore, where the Robertses have a land parcel that's been in the family for generations. Now, what I learned in college is that that land came from people who owned my family as slaves. And those people weren't white Americans, they were Chickasaw and Choctaw Indians. This was so surprising to me. This isn't something that we learn, I'm sure you would agree. And Americans, especially Black Americans, like to think of ourselves as a group of people who can relate to Native Americans. They had their land stolen, we had our labor stolen. And there are certainly stories of Black and Native people in various times and places in North America who did come together to fight colonization and fight prejudice. For example, in the colonial era, some Eastern tribes welcomed runaway slaves and formed communities with mixed race people and multicultural traditions. And in Florida, Black and Native people fought multiple wars together against American incursion. In the 1960s, the Black Power Movement banded together with Native activists, the Red Power Movement, to push for civil rights and tribal sovereignty. During the Keystone Pipeline protests around 2017, and the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020, both Black and Native people worked together to bring attention to these causes. And so those, those are just a few examples. There are plenty of moments like that. But unfortunately, there have also been many times when Black and Native people worked against one another, hoping to ensure that they would better obtain circumstances for themselves. And Black slave ownership was one way that some Native Americans did this. They bought into a system that deemed Black people inferior in order to make money and fit into a new society that was increasingly controlled by white Americans who supported slavery as an economic and social institution. Now, the five Indian nations with slave-owning tribal members were the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole nations. And these nations are probably familiar to you because, of course, they all are located in Oklahoma but they're also some of the largest and most influential Indian nations in the country. This month, you're going to hear from Dr. Nakia Parker, who will give you some of this early history about slavery in these native nations. And then I'm going to follow up by talking about black emancipation, what that looked like in Indian nations, and how the relationships between black people and native Americans evolved through the late 19th century and the early 20th century. When Dr. Arthur Carter invited me to speak with you, he told me how there have been scattered discussions around campus about the land that the seminary sits on, how the Cherokees and Osages contest whose land it was and is, and how that makes it difficult to use a simple land acknowledgement to talk about who used to reside in the area. Now, I have thoughts about land acknowledgements in general, but this gets to the heart of what I wrote about in my first book and what I'm going to discuss in my talk. And that's how land throughout Oklahoma has been constantly claimed by different groups of people. And so the five Indian nations who own black slaves may live in Oklahoma now, but they're from the Southeast, Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, Florida, Tennessee. They were forced to move by white Americans who wanted to settle on their land, mine for gold, and use enslaved African-Americans to plant their crops. When they arrived in Oklahoma, which was then known as Indian Territory, they were setting foot in their new home. But this was land that was already claimed by the Osage people, as well as others like the Comanches and Wichitas and Apaches. But the federal government didn't acknowledge these Western Indians' claims to this land. And so the United States actually created a situation where multiple people felt this land was theirs. And that, of course, caused competition, conflict, murder, theft, violence. And the competing claims didn't stop with just that, with just Native people. 
when people like my ancestors were emancipated from their Native American slave owners, they also tried to claim the same land. Then, getting into the 1880s and 1890s, white and Black Americans coming from the United States did the same, tried to claim this land. So all of these groups were working off of the belief that the people before them didn't adequately, adequately settle the land and weren't civilized enough to make real claims. And so to understand this, we have to talk about how race and settlement have functioned in this part of the West. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to you in March, and I will see you soon.